So just what was Ireland like when the Norwegian Vikings began raiding the coast of Ireland in the 9th century? The Irish annals describe the site, and it must have been quite terrifying, of seeing a fleet of 60 longboats on the rivers Boyne and Liffey in 837, and how Norse forts were then set up in Anagassan and Dublin, and how, by 853, the famous Olafur the White, who was born in Ireland, is a Viking sea king in Dublin. And just 20 years later, people, particularly from Ireland, are taken by the Norse, mostly as slaves, to begin the settlement of a new country, Iceland. And over the coming decades, their destinies, that of Ireland, the Norse and Iceland, are intertwined. So that today, geneticists say over 60% of the women and 20% of the men settling Iceland and shaping the Icelandic people today were Gaelic. I'm Helen Shaw, and this is Mother's Blood, Sister's Songs, the story of how the genetics of Iceland reveals its female Irish roots in story and song. So to find out more about Ireland at the time, I sought out Dr Elizabeth Boyle. She's an outstanding historian of medieval Ireland with a doctorate in Anglo-Saxon, Celtic and Norse from Cambridge University. So I'm Lizzie Boyle. I'm the head of the Department of Early Irish in Maynooth and I teach the medieval Irish language, literature and history. And I'm interested in the kind of intellectual culture of Ireland, especially from the 9th through to the 12th centuries. Can you give us a picture about 9th century Gaelic Ireland? What's happening? Who's living here? And a little bit of it, just, you know, that bird's eye view if we're sitting over Gaelic Ireland in around that period of, of the mid 9th century. OK, so first of all, I would say that 9th century Ireland was politically complex. You have a whole series of kingdoms, some of them more powerful than others, a lot of them competing for power, for territory, to be the over kings uh, of other kingdoms. The dominant dynasty, especially in the northern half of Ireland, uh, were the people known as the Inyale, from where we get the modern surname O'Neill. And they were generally holding the high kingship of Ireland, which really is a kind of claim to the kingship of Tara and to most of the northern half of the island of Ireland. But there are other kingdoms uh, in the south, in Munster, and also the territory of Leinster, which tends to be this kind of intermediary war zone between the competing northern and southern kingdoms. So within this kind of complex political situation, you have a very hierarchical society. There are slaves, people who are unfree. There are free farmers um, who owe allegiance to local lords and those lords themselves owe allegiance to regional kings and ultimately to over kings and within that kind of hierarchical society uh, you also have the christian church as a really important cultural force a major landowner an administrator of justice and law in the locality as well as offering kind of religious guidance and perhaps most importantly the influence of the church is in the fact that it controls literacy and education so all of our written sources that we have that tell us about ninth century ireland about the politics about warfare about everyday life they are all written by people who are educated within the church so the church is in a way controlling what we can know about 9th century Ireland. This idea that there's a written culture, that the church is there, that we have manuscripts, but in our inherited manuscripts they are ones that have come through the church. Because if you, if you think about it, you know, while it's, it's a roundabout route, the Book of Kells is around early 9th century. So when you think about what's happening in Ireland and the ways in which society is working, Give us a sense about how the structure is in terms of language and literacy for people 
across you, you know the country and you've already brought that in that you're going to have people who come from a courtly society and to the fact that there are Gaelic slaves as well. Okay so um, one of the things that's quite striking actually about the early medieval Irish church is its bilingualism between Latin and Irish. Elsewhere in Europe Latin tends to dominate literate culture, whereas here in Ireland we have people writing in both Irish and Latin. So people who are educated within the church would be bilingual in that sense. But also, as you alluded to, this the, the practice of taking slaves and especially kind of overseas slave raiding means that you would also have a kind of small but significant population of people that might have been captured for example in Britain and brought over to Ireland as slaves and they would of course be speaking their language um, as well but yeah the practice of taking slaves is not just an international phenomenon I mean we tend to think most famously of St Patrick in the fifth century being brought from Britain but actually people within Ireland could be enslaved so slave raiding could be across border territory say between Leinster and Munster for example not just overseas so you could have Gaelic people being taken as slaves from other kingdoms you could also become enslaved in your own kingdom if you were unable to pay for example compensation that was set for a crime you know enslavement is a kind of ultimate sanction in a way for people who couldn't pay penalties and fines um, through legal process So the slave population could have been quite numerically significant, but a lot of slaves would themselves be Gaelic-speaking Irish people um, and not just people who'd been taken from, from overseas. So it's a society where you have a multiplicity of powerhouses already operating in Ireland. And in some ways, then, we bring in external forces like the Norwegians in terms of the Norse invasions, and the presence of the Vikings, which later becomes Danish Vikings as well. And so Gaelic chieftains in those kind of conflicts with themselves, but also then with external invaders, they were quite used to actually being quite pragmatic. I think one of the most important factors is the fact that these provincial Irish kings are concerned with consolidating and expanding their own power. And when new people come in, the Vikings, it's astonishing how quickly they become assimilated into the political scene and very quickly you have alliances between Irish kings and Vikings because it's to the advantage of the Irish kings in helping them compete against their local rivals. So in a sense the Vikings you know they are a disruptive force especially initially with the with raiding but it is a very quick process of assimilation because they just become an additional part of the political scene that they can you know people can ally with to their own advantage but i think in terms of thinking about the ninth century it's it's in a way far more useful to think about a kind of irish sea zone i think we from our modern perspective tend to get sort of fixated on ireland as an island But actually, the ease with which sea travel happened, the centrality of of the Irish sea zone for for trade as well as for raiding and and invasion, means that places that we might think of as slightly peripheral, like um, the Isle of Man, for example, or Anglesey, or the kind of Hebridean islands and so on, were actually really central um, seaways that people are continually travelling to and, and through. And so Ireland is part part of this Irish sea zone that involves people interacting, trading, slaving, fighting and so on. But it's a very multicultural, multilingual kind of environment. And that can seem slightly alien to us from a modern perspective. So even when we go to the story of Melkorka, the supposed Icelandic mute slave princess, her family, the, the, the O'Neills, would have already had intermarriage and interrelationships, which were quite like clearly like political and embedded and over a long period with the Vikings. So can you give us a sense about the position of women? Because again, I can understand and maybe make that clear. It would depend what family you came from and what your position of power is if you're a daughter of a king compared to a daughter of a slave or a slave yourself. Okay, well, realistically, uh, I think the fundamental starting point is the fact that in early Irish law, a woman was worth half what a man was. Okay, but as you've alluded to, there's a 
a further issue of social hierarchy. So a royal woman is worth half of her male equivalent, but that is still a lot more than someone much lower down the social hierarchy. So you've got these two axes, you might say, one of gender, but the other of of hierarchy. So women have far fewer rights than men, but a high status woman could have some capacity for some kind of autonomy. To be honest, I think the the most promising route for a woman in terms of having any kind of power or or autonomy at that time was to go into the church. And you do get, you know, women with a considerable amount of power who are abbesses of, of important ecclesiastical establishments. For a royal woman who, you know, is, is in lay society, you know, who she marries is going to be controlled by her father or, or siblings in, in, in terms of, you know, strategic alliances. A high status woman could perhaps expect to be married several times if her husband is killed in battle and she's then, the family's trying to construct new strategic alliances so she could be sent off to another husband. Um, Again, a decision that's really beyond her control. But of course, from the ninth century, the, the Vikings are another kind of factor in this. And so high status Irish women are being married off to the Viking kings of Dublin or uh, Limerick or Waterford. And so we could expect high status Gaelic women to be married to high status Scandinavian men and, you know, to be producing bilingual children who are, you know, fluent in both uh, in Norse and, and Irish. So if you think about Ireland at the time, you know, and you try to think about, like you've mentioned some of the cities, and, and we know, obviously, you know, the, the roots of those cities in, in Viking establishments, Dublin, Waterford, etc. But, you know, where is the power basis in Ireland and how does Dublin sit into that as, as we move from 19th to 10th century Ireland? Okay, so Ireland, before the Vikings arrived, was an entirely non-urban society. We don't have towns. What the Vikings bring are urban settlements. So the big game changer is the establishment of these urban centres. And Dublin is, of course, the most successful of those, becomes the largest, because it's so ideally situated for this whole, what I've called the, you know, kind of Irish Sea zone or the the, uh, Irish Sea world. But other towns also are important, like Waterford, like uh, Limerick and so on. And this allows a kind of economic complexity that you haven't seen previously in Ireland. It allows a kind of a place for for the gathering of significant kind of multicultural populations because it's a big international trading port and boats coming in from overseas and it's something that really shifts the economic development of Ireland as well as cultural uh, cultural development too so when we get to the the events that that lead to the, the settlement of Iceland by really Norwegians um, chieftains escaping King Harold and a gathering and we have this whole settlement both origin story which is both truth and myth which manifests then in the writings from Iceland so from your take on the Gaelic side what's your understanding about how we in terms of Gaelic Ireland connect the settlement of Iceland well I think we tend to often focus on the extremes. On the one hand, there are the slave women being enslaved, Irish women being taken to Iceland by their Norse captors. And at the other end, we tend to think about the kind of princesses, the royal marriages, and again, sort of high status women being taken by high status men. But I think it's more complicated than that, more nuanced than that. We're, we're looking at interactions across the whole range of society. And yes, it's happening to people at the very top. And yes, it's happening to people who are enslaved. But these are people who have been intermarrying already for you know, a century or so before you get the initial settlement of, of Iceland. And even to, to talk about you know, Ireland is is a, a false and anachronistic kind of thing because if you think about, for example, the kingdom of Darreda, it encompasses both northeast of the island of Ireland, but also 
bits of what are now Scotland and, and the Western Isles. And so it's not something that's contained within the island of Ireland. Um, so we've had this kind of interactive, dynamic kind of Irish sea zone of people traveling in the Isle of Man, in Wales, in what's now kind of England, in what's now Scotland. And Iceland is in some ways a sort of c- continuation of, of that, of this kind of dynamic, um, interconnected world. And so we shouldn't be surprised that we see, you know, a large amount of Irish, especially female ancestry there in in Iceland, because at all levels of society, women have been intermarrying and uh, reproducing with their Scandinavian neighbours. I think from your perspective, maybe just to to settle on the Melkorka story, Laxdala gives us this version of of an encounter of a girl taken when she's about 15 and obviously ends up in a trading market in Norway with a Russian merchant. So she's gone through a hell of a loop. She's obviously been traded back and forth. But when you read that or when you look at it now or you look at also the, you know, what was happening here in Ireland, what's your take on Melkorka? Well, I think the Melkorka story is... um one of a whole complex of stories in Irish as well as in Old Norse about what must have been a fairly familiar phenomenon, the woman who is enslaved and who ends up in a sexual relationship, whether consensual or not, with her owner. So if we think about about the same time, we get stories in Ireland, you know, for example, from the origin story of the Inail themselves, the story of their ancestor figure, Neil Neugielach, who is said to be the son of a royal male, but a, an enslaved mother. And the enslaved mother turns out to be a, a Saxon princess. Okay, so it's this story of the noble or, or royal woman who ends up in slavery in a different kingdom and uh, ends up bearing the child of her royal owner. And it exists in also different kind of varieties and variations. So again, an origin story that's given to St. Bridget is that she also is the offspring of an enslaved mother and a royal father. And we see slave narratives also of of occasionally of male slaves as well. So one scholar that we know quite a lot about, a guy called Erbertok Makosha, who was the head of teaching and learning at a monastery near Roscarbury, County Cork. He too was kidnapped by Vikings. And we know about him because the King of Ireland at the time, Brian Baru, paid the ransom to free him. So there are clearly cases where some people are considered valuable or important enough to pay ransoms to free them from enslavement. And then you get the perhaps more familiar story of the woman who just gets lost to slavery and uh, far more women who don't have stories about them and are just lost to history as anonymous um, anonymous enslaved women. But the fact that you get so many stories about the idea of the ro- royal enslaved woman suggests that it is, you know, a kind of an everyday phenomenon. What do we know about her alleged dad then? Because uh, MacArthur was then quite famous. But what do we know about her father and this period? Well, he's certainly recorded as being a king of Alech in what's now modern day Donegal and therefore part of that bigger power structure and, and competition for power amongst these um, kind of Inyal kings and so on. I would be cautious, although I find the story of Melkorka plausible as a scenario, it's important to remember that we only have it as a much uh, later, a much more elaborated kind of literary story. So whatever the kernel of truth is there is very hard to excavate now because it's um, embedded in this kind of very literary sort of story. And you get this same kind of literary device in, in a lot of other narratives around about the same time. I suppose the bit that becomes more challenging in terms of envisaging is the Laxdala saga saying that her son Olaf comes back to Ireland, meets King Murkata, as they would say, and is embraced by him because he speaks such good Irish. <laughs> well, on the one hand, the way that it's presented in the, the narrative is 
very suggestive of motifs that we find in medieval Irish narrative literature. Uh, the most famous example being the son of Cuchulain, who is born overseas and comes back and there's a, a ring as an indicator of identity and so on. And it's actually almost in a way more interesting that the possibility that the writers of the Icelandic sagas have been influenced by Irish narrative literature because the echoes seem quite strong in terms of that literary device. But that being said, it's not implausible that uh, an, a, an Irish or the son of an Irish king born overseas could come back because we see the parallel with the situation of the King Griffith Ap Kinnan in Wales who uh, has Irish ancestry and flee, comes back to Ireland and then brings Irish military support to help him reclaim the kingship back in Wales and so on. So this this movement of royal sons back to the the territories where they have you know maternal kin or or whatever is not in itself improbable but just the way that it's presented in the narrative is perhaps even more interesting because it seems to show a literary influence from Irish saga narratives. What's unusual about Iceland is they tell the story in writing in the sagas they write the stories down 12th 13th century and then this was the question is like why is it that Iceland writes do you see a connection to the fact that there is this manuscript rich tradition in Iceland which tells the stories? I think we're only beginning to understand the potential literary and cultural influence that Ireland had on Norse written culture. But I think as we become aware of it, we can see that the sagas are products of the time when they were written, even though they do contain material that has been handed down from from earlier. The act of writing, the moment of writing, is uh, an ideological and a cultural act which draws on a huge amount of of influence. I think we're only beginning to realise just how much influence there might be from Irish written culture on the earliest Norse uh, Norse writings, but we know. For example, even um, in terms of stuff that is being written in Norway, that uh, the great text, the King's Mirror, the Konungskuggsjau, uh, which is written in, in Norway in the 13th century, has a whole section on Ireland, on the kind of wonders of Ireland and talking about Irish kind of fantastical geography and so on. So even in some of our earliest sources that are written in Old Norse, they are showing an explicit awareness of Ireland and interest in Ireland and the idea that Ireland is a is a, a fantastical place, a kind of magical place, perhaps in the same way that from an Irish perspective, a lot of the medieval Irish stories characterise places like Norway as magical kind of places and fantastical places. So it's a, a reciprocal cultural literary relationship. And that's Dr. Elizabeth Boyle, Head of Early Irish at Maynooth University. And if you'd like to find out more about Elizabeth's work and research, I've put some links in the profile text for the podcast. And you can follow our story on mothersbloodsisterssongs.com. Thanks for listening. <laughs>